Hey, Scissor G. How's everyone doing today? Q is the placement of the board and everything okay? Safe and sane, that's pretty good. Yeah, we're gonna hope my internet holds out. <clears throat> there are times it's been bad. Here should do it. True, Scissor G, it's not a done deal as of yet, though. Yeah, there's a lot to it, and you'll see by the end what I really imply by the word should. I had a conversation with someone who substituted the word deserve for should, which was certainly not my intent. Well, true scissor G, but I think there was also a little bit of an uptick when Chantal was advertising to other education groups and local chat. That helped.
I have 10 o'clock. Should, um, any objections to starting? Okay. All right, so. Let me welcome you all to another edition of the Science Circle Weekend Presentations. I am Stephen Gazer, known here locally in Second Life as Stephen Zootfly. And the topic for my talk today, uh, genomic parasites nibbling away at us, why I should win the Nobel Prize, is gonna talk a little bit about some work I did as a postdoc which was at the Tulane Cancer Center. And that one thing I want to point out early on is that my involvement in this field and the title is a narrative structure that I wanted to present this as. And you'll see kind of by the end what I think the importance is of the research of this field. And that within 10 or 20 years, I would say it's a virtual guarantee that if the science keeps going the way it is, that somewhere, somehow, people in this field will be rewarded with a Nobel Prize. So I'm gonna try and structure the talk to give you this basic background narrative of kind of context, and then give a little bit of a, a sideways introduction to another field, which is typical of many important discoveries is two things converging. And I'll talk about my work, and then I'll talk about the uh, the impact and the work after that. Now, one thing I have to apologize for, for anybody who's a real aficionado with the field or science, I have to bias a lot of the data that I show, and I'm going to show a lot of data today, or it's things that are a little more accessible and visually and accessible to me and not behind a paywall. And today there will be a lot of data. Uh, don't get intimidated by the slides. I will be walking you through the experiments, and I have a little extra arrow here to help me point things out. And on top of that, I also, ha like I have in other presentations, I have some green text, which is the takeaway message for many of the more complicated slides. So I have also tried to make this relatively short, so there's time for people to stop me with questions if there's something really confusing, and to pause a few places to click in to reflect on the first segment. So again, like a good science talk, I wanna try and go back as far as possible in the science. And what I wanna talk about is this, to lead off with is this kind of general phenomenon, these syndromes that are called progeria syndromes. And these are, progeria is a way of saying aging, getting old. And these are called segmental progeria syndromes because they're not necessarily specifically in advanced aging, but they have elements of aging that then manifest themselves in these syndromes. And one of the oldest and most classic one of these is Werner syndrome, which was first named and characterized in 1904. And again, you can see from the picture that the normal looking young woman, by the time she reaches 45, looks more like she's a relatively unhealthy 85, 90 years old. And then there are other syndromes that have been described in the literature, in the medical literature, of um, that have more characteristics of developmental neurological delays, although they do span other uh, symptoms like uh, predisposition to cancer. Uh, they actually show DNA sensitivity in cases. Uh, this one on the top right is Nimogen Brachid syn Syndrome. And again, you'll see this uh, odd morphology of the skull. They are smaller brain sizes and have um, developmental delays. Uh, and actually, usually they do die relatively early. Uh, this one is also particularly char characterized by when people look at the cells from people with the syndrome, they have a lot of breaks in them. You can actually observe these breaks when you break apart cells and take a look at them. And then the bottom right, or so the bottom one is Seckel syndrome. Again, another syndrome characterized similarly by these abnormal brains, case sizes and shapes, and then other sensitivities, early death, um, susceptibility to cancer. So I have some further reading links that talk a lot about these syndromes, 
But I just want this to stick in your head is that there are these common features of these syndromes, but they're not always exactly the same presentation. They seem similar and related, but they're not always the same. Now I'm gonna step back and step very small and talk about a lot of the interesting molecular genetics that happened in the early or the mid 1900s. And what the power here was that with single celled organisms like with bacteria and yeast, you could mutagenize their genomes. You could take a whole culture of them so that they all have different mutations in different places and then screen for phenotypes. And the phenotype that I'm showing here is on this top plate, you have this mutagenized group of yeast and you just put them out. And then you'll notice that the arrangement of, of colonies is the same as on the bottom plate. But there are, two, there are two things that are happening here is that you expose the bottom plate, not the top plate, just the bottom plate to either X-rays as represented by the lightning bolt or say UV light again. And what do we know about X-rays and UV light? And this is a question for the audience. What do you know about those types of things happening in cells? Vic says mutations, definitely a part of it. Breaking bonds, yes, they're attacking DNA and chemically modifying it in ways that's bad. And if you have enough of a dose, you die. Um, but in fact, many cells can survive certain doses of, of damage. And, but if you have a mutation in something that helps you repair that DNA damage, then you'll see these two arrows, those colonies did not grow. And so now, yes, Mike Shaw points out exactly what I was saying is that a lot of, depending on the dose, a lot of cells are fine, but the ones that are mutated and less and more sensitive to damage, they die. So you can go back and what Genesis did was went back and identified what these were, use genetics and name them. And what I'm showing here are some complicated pathways. You only need to know a couple key lessons from these pictures is that there are different types of damage. So uh, UV damage that links up DNA together is repaired by nucleotide excision repair. Again, it has to be recognized as that type of damage. And then a variety of different proteins come in to accomplish different steps of the repair process. And you'll notice that some of these genes are called rad genes, if you look really closely at the picture. On the right, we have a double strand break. So the whole DNA is broken on, on both sides. So the latter is broken. And so different repair proteins have to come in. This is a repair pathway called homologous recombination, or HR. And again, you'll see different proteins involved on this side than on the other pathway. And again, very stepwise, there's different proteins coming in and doing things. And so where you see the names, you know, RAD something or XRS, X-ray sensitive, those are indications that some of these were found in these screens. Although they have other names too, because they're sometimes like the gene uh, replication protein A, that's a protein that's involved in repair, but it was actually first found as being involved in DNA replication. Now, what I want to do is take one example of these proteins and talk very specifically about how science understands how they work. And so one of the most well-known RAD proteins is RAD51. Now what I'm showing here on the top is both an assay and a demonstration of its activity. And so the idea here is that that little squiggle you see on the left-hand side is single strand DNA that's a circle. And what RAD51 protein will do is it'll coat that, it'll coat that DNA and form what's called a nucleofilament. So a complex of all these different RAD51 proteins winding around that DNA. Uh, and Vic has pointed out, yeah, the bottom gel, we're gonna talk about gel electrophoresis in a minute. And then you present this nucleofilament with linear double-stranded DNA, where you see that little five prime, that is double-stranded DNA that's just linear, not circular. And if you put these things together, what'll happen is the RAD51 nucleofilament will displace one of the strands of the double-stranded DNA resulting in the end over here in circular double-stranded DNA versus single-stranded linear DNA. What Vic is pointing out is that this is an assay that's been known for a long time where you just run this on a very simple gel where anything that's faster migrates farther. And that's just one of the simple lessons of gel electrophoresis with DNA but that these different molecules, either the nicked circle DNA or the double-stranded linear DNA have different migration patterns. And the fact that over time, this nicked circle, the one that is now the new product, increases over time 
with the pre with RAD51 present in the media. And so what this is saying is that the specific role of this protein is to bind up, get around single-stranded DNA, and then use that to go find double-stranded DNA to accomplish repair, to make sure you're finding the same sequence to repair that double-strand break. And I think it's important. I have one citation here of Patrick Sung in the Robertson uh, lab that first demonstrated that the RAD51 protein from yeast was able to accomplish this, but there was actually a whole host of papers, Steve West, Steve Kowalskakowski, who showed that these RAD51 from either yeast or human can accomplish this. And this is something that, if you actually go back even farther to bacteria, RAD51 is known as a RecA homolog. RecA is a protein that's been known to accomplish this type of strand exchange uh, for a very long time. Now, like I mentioned already, we have these diagrams to talk about the proteins that help this out. And this is where I'm gonna come back to Again, making this a little bit about me. And I'm going to talk about my graduate work. And so the, the question was, is we know these, this RAD51 protein accomplishes this, but both from genetics and um, what we can kind of predict from E. coli, that there are other proteins that must be helping it do what it does. And so the technique that you see here in the top left-hand side, this is another way of getting about do proteins interact. And this is actually in exploded yeast cells. We basically take the nucleus, explode it, and try and uh, detect protein complexes using a technique known as immunofluorescence. This is antibodies that recognize the protein. So these glowing balls, what you see are these glowing balls that basically represent that particular protein. And what we argued was that this other protein known as RAD52 associates with RAD51. It also associates with RPA inside cells that are doing double strand break repair arguing that they, they may be working together. But then also from a molecular genetic standpoint, the idea that if you have a yeast cell that's completely missing RAD52, and that's why you have the lowercase RAD52 name there, that RAD51 doesn't form foci. And so that's saying RAD51 depends upon RAD52 to form its complexes and to do its job. And so that's what we argued here with the molecular genetics. And really the basic result of this is the diagram you see on the right arguing that there's this stepwise formation of repair complexes, they recognize the break, they form complexes, and then they accomplish the goal. And again, I think this technique of doing yeast immunofluorescence was very powerful. It was um, coming out at the same time that people were doing very simple, or the same type of biochemical experiments that you saw before, uh, show that RAD52 also helps mediate RAD51. And this is a citation I have here, a colleague of our of that lab, Akira Shinohara, Tomoko Ogawa, who um, demonstrated the same thing. So again, this is the way we get at how genes work and whether, um, and how we understand what's, what genes and proteins do in a cell. And now I'm gonna just pose a question, everyone. Do you guys know of any genes involved in cancer? What, what are some of the first genes that come to mind that have to do with cancer that you may have heard about? Yeah, so Sumo Itano specifically mentions BRCA, BRCA1 as well as BRCA2 are the... Um, Probably most well-known, I mean, P53 is the one that's known, I think, most well among scientists, but BRCA1, BRCA2, the breast cancer susceptibility genes. And this was coming out, and its cloning, what it was doing in cells, came out around this time in the, in the late 1990s, and then was really being characterized as a part of a DNA repair protein. And so, again, what I have here in the diagram is a very, again, a summary of a huge amount of work in the literature, saying that BRCA1 as we understand it, and it's mutated, has a very bad effect on cells. That because it plays this crossroads role in coordinating repair processes, then when it's missing, then of course cells start to go bad. They have error-prone repair processes that lead to mutations, and now we know one of the basic underlying concepts is that, um, uh, you know, the mutations that arrive from Poorly done repair is a big problem. So Vic actually mentions it quickly. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct your numbers on this real quick. 
So Vic says, I had to look it up, but it appears that P53 has a role in 50% of cancers. And P53 is something that helps coordinate damage response more from the cell cycle, not the damage repair part, but the cell cycle. And that 50% number is actually a little bit misleading. That P53 mutations are found in about 50% of cancers, but about 90% of cancers have a mutation in some gene that affect the P53 pathway. So there's another protein called MDM2, which controls how much P53 protein there is or how much phosphorylation there is. And so these are things where P53 really is kind of considered a central tumor suppressor. So, and, and something that had been known for a long, so I'm gonna go back to uh, talk about the right hand figure here, which is what's been known about cancer for a long time. And a lot of this was pioneering work um, by cytogeneticists with lymphocyte, uh, um, lymphatic cancers, uh, leukemias, but then has been characterized as a general phenomenon of cancer cells, is that if you look at the picture, you see lots of colorful blobs. And what those colorful blobs represent are ways of painting human chromosomes. Now, in theory, the way these are designed, any given chromosome should just be one color. The whole length of it should just be one color. So these little examples here where you see a combination of blue and red on one chromosome is an indication that things have gotten rearranged. And so again, I'm citing a paper here from Janet Rowley, a very nice visual one. She's also someone that uh, helped identify the so-called Philadelphia chromosome. She won the Lasker Prize, and she actually was a nice old lady who uh, was faculty at U of Chicago when I was there and was always riding around on a bicycle. That's a little part of it. But the key lesson here, and this is the crossroads of what we are understanding about cancer, is that there are genes involved in DNA repair that play an important role in how we basically try to not get cancer. And then when those can't, then when those genes do something wrong or not working correctly, that leads to cancer. And what I wanna talk about now, just let's bring it back to my first picture. When we talk about Werner syndrome, NBS and Seckel syndrome. We know the genes that cause those. It's relatively easy to map and understand the genes now, but even at the time people did a lot of work to understand and name these genes. And what we, and when you start sequencing the genes, people discovered that they are basically radiation-based repair proteins that were found in yeast. Uh, again, that uh, the gene involved in Werner syndrome is an SGS1 homolog. Uh, NBS1 has a functional ortholog known as X-ray sensitive two, and Seckel syndrome is caused by defects in the ATR gene which is basically an ortholog of MEC1, also known as RAD3 in a different type of yeast. And I think this is a critically important part is that we really do understand a lot about how human biology works by studying very simple organisms. And the other thing is that the power of a lot of molecular genetics for most of the 1900s really came from trying to understand what a protein does by what happens when it's absent. And that is an important, um, way to approach science from a genetics point of view is that we can infer what something does when we design assays that tell us very exquisitely what might it be involved in. And so anyway, that's the first package and story talking about DNA repair, cancer, uh, aging syndromes. And I'm going to go to a little bit of a sideways story called talk about rep repetitive DNA. And this is another story where, again, if you go far back enough in the 1900s, I think 1930s, 1940s, people did very simple experiments to demonstrate that there was something unusual about eukaryotic chromosomes, or genomes. And that is, in this top left-hand corner, if you were to basically heat and boil up all the DNA that you extracted from some organism cells, and then let that re-anneal and measure how fast it goes from being single-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA, this would be a straight line, this top chart. But the fact that human, mouse, other complicated organisms, DNA, had these weird bumps in it meant that things were coming together faster than you would expect from normal single copy kinetics. And I'm gonna give a quick analogy here that if you're say at a cotillion and you have a dance card and your dance card is one specific other person that you have to go find, you can just imagine you let the whole crowd go and it's gonna take a while for everybody to find that one specific partner. But let's say it's a 4th of July cotillion and all the men are wearing red, white, or blue, and all the women are wearing red, white, and blue, that if your sound card 
is, or sorry, if your dance card is just saying um, dance with someone who's wearing the same color as you are, then people will come together much more rapidly. That's because they don't have to search for something specific. They can search for something more general, more matching. And that's the way these things work. And it indicates that large proportions of genomes basically are the same little copy of something over and over. And what's for the human genome, one of the first clonings and demonstrations of what that was, was on the top right-hand side, again, Prescott Dinier in the lab of Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt, a big pioneer in the field. What he showed was that they could clone out this specific element and sequence it. And they ended up calling it ALU because it has an ALU restriction site in it. But it is a small element that exists in like about a million copies in the human genome. And what it is, is it's just a small little sequence that as far as they could tell, expresses RNA. Doesn't make a protein, it's not a gene, it's just some small element that expresses itself. And so uh, people have used that type of power to just basically make nice pretty pictures. And what we have here from the uh, Wikipedia talking about ALU is this nice picture where they, again, they stained all the human chromosomes and wherever you see a lot of green, that tells you there's a lot of ALU elements. And so that's just a demonstration of the prevalence of these within the human genome. But as far as we know, they don't do anything, right? They're just there. So let's talk about where I think this field really got its most interesting start. And that, that is in the lab of Hay Kazazian. And what we have here in the top is this diagram of the human uh, clotting factor seven. Uh, factor, just sorry, eight, sorry, factor eight, where these numbers and these lines are basically saying, here are the exons for this gene. This is how this gene gets made. This is the structure of the gene. And what they discovered through cloning and looking at an individual patient was this big chunk of DNA sitting in the middle of it for someone who had hemophilia. And then another patient, they found a similar large chunk of DNA. That was a different chunk of DNA in them. Now, when they went and looked at the parents, and sequence the parents' DNA, these chunks weren't there. So something must have happened either very early in embryogenesis of the individuals or in the germ cells of the parents. And so this is a unique active event. And what they sequenced it and said, this is what's known as a line one element, a, a known repetitive sequence in human genomes. And they even went through the work to find the source element. And this is the key thing is that these things don't jump in general, unless you have an intact element to help it accomplish all the things it takes to jump around in the genome. And so what I have in this diagram is showing uh, there's a promoter, the 5' prime UTR. There's an open reading frame that encodes a protein that helps bind the RNA, helps bind to DNA. There's ORF2, which has an endonuclease activity. That's the EN. It has a reverse transcriptase activity, and that's where you take RNA and replicate it into DNA. And so this life cycle allows an intact element, like we saw in these patients, to accomplish something that's now called transcription pri primed reverse, sorry, transcription primed reverse trans uh, transposition. And so uh, again, there's a target site, it cuts the DNA, noticing it's this black flap is coming off so that one strand is cut. Then it has to come in and cut the other strand in order to then synthesize DNA from RNA and then make a second copy. And so now you have this insertion of an element just like we saw in the factor eight G. Now, one thing that I'll point out here, and this was, was very intriguing to me as a, in terms of thinking about doing, going into this lab, was this looks like a double strand break. And so I'll come back to that idea. I wanna pop that idea in your head real quick before I talk a little bit more about why these become relevant. This is not just an exercise in these things being in genomes, but we now know from this work that these are active, that these are jumping around, at least in our germ. And so again, the capstone of the, the story of repetitive elements in, in certain ways was the human genome sequencing. And this was, a, again, an international consortium that published in Nature. There's also the Craig Ventner company that published in Science. And the important thing and the take home message from the first parts of the slide is that probably over 50% of our genome is based on repetitive elements. There's more of them than us when we think about it. And this top 
diagram is sh showing a kind of quantitative comparison of repeated elements versus exons. Again, exons are things that make the genes, the proteins in our cells. And they're a lot more red than there are blue. And then the other interesting story here, this is a diagram I always hesitate to show, but I think there's an important lesson to come from it, is that this chart is showing the different types of repetitive elements that are historically been in our genome and how active they are. And so the x-axis is basically showing how much things have mutated over time. And so that x-axis rep represents time frame. And that what we have now, if you look very closely at just this, these small little peaks here, this is the last, you know, uh, 500,000 years. And it's not not, um, not very active compared to the past. So in many, many ways, we're lucky to have a genome that's more stable with these than it was before. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what the, the total time frame of this chart actually represents? This 34% uh, substitution in terms of time? I'll give you a hint. The light blue is an element that started in primates. Yeah, what sort of evolutionary time scale are we looking at here? Certain primates. Yeah, we're actually looking at 200 million years. This, this graph actually represents about 200 million years of, of eukaryotic genomes and, our, our ans and human ancestry. Okay, so let me summarize this first part. And that is, in our genomes, there are these intact elements that carry proteins that allow it to jump around. And these are known as line one long interspersed nuclear elements. I prefer the old time name. And it encodes proteins that allow it to jump around and move around. And their activity is dependent upon those. And then they accomplish this by a process that means they have to break DNA in order to get in there, right? It's like having to uh, break open a door to get inside a house. And so to me, when it came time to think about what I want to do for my postdoc and had a, an offer on the, on the table, is that in the context of what was going on in the cancer field, in the context of what was going on um, that, that to me there was this intriguing idea that these are double strand breaks that are being recognized by cellular repair factors that may be important for their biology. And I'm connecting this back to the picture with the cancer. I didn't necessarily know which ones it would be. I had a, a couple of good guesses. I a, a, uh, wanted to test a few ideas in the first place. But then, of course, the idea that happened as I was doing the work was how well does this relate to aging? How well does this relate to actually a real true biological effect in terms of pathologies or just our normal biology? And so that was really the big question was, can we really say these are making double strand breaks? Is that an intermediate in the pathway? Does it work that way? And so this is uh, my main paper from 2006 where again, we did one of these assays where we used immunofluorescence. We had, these pro we had this protein known as H2AX that had been discovered by other people as being something that is at double strand breaks very early. And we did this assay where we took both human cancer cell lines, we took mouse cell lines, and we basically expressed L1 elements in them. And what you can see from this first diagram, again, the first one's a control, so you don't see any spots. This next one here, lots and lots of spots. Again, if, this, if we had to try and make this many spots with radiation, with an X-ray machine, it would have been a highly lethal dose. And so this was that kind of wow moment of, wow, there's a lot more, there's a lot of double strand breaks here than we otherwise would have expected. And what we also just double checked was that this high level of double strand breaks required the endonuclease function of the ORF2. Again, there's still a little bit here, and that's, you know, that's there's an interesting story there, but there's still a little bit of double strand break activity. Uh, the reverse transcriptase is missing in this particular diagram, but there's still a little bit of double strand breaks. So it's missing the RT, but you don't need the RT to make breaks. Maybe you need them to stabilize them. And then what was also another interesting aspect of this was you don't need that first protein in order to make double strand breaks. You do need that to typically accomplish retrotransposition, but in terms of at least making some degree of breaks, you don't need that. And so that was one way of characterizing the double strand break activity. The other one here is this thing. Anybody want to hazard a guess of what this assay is called? Anybody know this one? This is where double strand breaks migrate in gels, but there's actually an acronym for it. Is 
So I understand there may be a problem with the chat extender, so I'm sorry if I've missed any answers that were from outside of 20 meters away from me. Uh, anyway, what do these look like? These look like little little comets. So this is known as a comet assay. And these tails, the tails of the comet represent broken DNA from double strand breaks. And so again, demonstrating that these are creating these in cells when you express them. And that again, having high levels of double strand breaks requires having that endonuclease function. This was published in 2006. There actually were other people in the field working on similar work. Uh, the Howdy lab looked at um, again, expressing an element that wasn't, you wouldn't expect to express as well and be as active, but again, they saw the same thing here where in different passages and generations of uh, human cancer cells, they saw the H2X foci indicating some level of double strand breaks that persist and go on. And this other group, again, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, they basically allowed expression of, of elements in meiosis. And what they're showing here is the expression of the ORF1 protein. Once you allow derepression, you get rid of a gene that helps repress retro elements. And then over here, um, these little red spots here, this whole black and white, the white spots here, and then what they colorize red here, this is RAD51. Our old friend RAD51 that I used to work with in grad school as an indicator that when these L1s get expressed, these also cause double strand breaks in uh, meiotic cells. So one thing that was occurring before I started the postdoc was this uh, researcher named John Moran, who was in Hay Kazazian's lab, developed an assay. And the basic idea of this assay is that you express the L1 element, again, by introducing it into cells on expression vectors. But you also include a reverse gene, and a reverse gene that's gene that is split by an intron. And so this reverse gene, once it goes through retrotransposition, gets rid of that intron. Again, notice the yellow bar that you have here actually gets removed here. And now that blue gene is intact. And what that blue gene represents is a resistance marker that allows the cells to survive an antibiotic. And so what that actually represents in these assays, as shown here, that any sort of colony that's growing in this Petri plate represents a retrotransposition event. That individual colony came from one cell that had a retrotransposition event. And so what's really useful here is you have a quantitative assay for retrotransposition in cells. And again, this is the type of thing that molecular geneticists and scientists love, is a nice quantitative assay that you can work with. And then start making lots of charts. So and that's they're just demonstrating here that these elements work in HeLa cells and make lots of colonies. If they're missing the ability to be expressed, or if they're missing, say, the, retro, the reverse transcriptase part of the L1, they don't work. So again, a very nice assay. And this is something that they applied, try to understand how these things interact with DNA. And what I'll just cover briefly is this work by Tammy Morish that's now separately in John Moran's own independent lab of looking at cell lines and trying to get colonies from the endonuclease deficient mutants. And so the horizontal arrows, the gr horizontal green arrows represent what normally happens with endonuclease mutants in a normal cell. But what happens in the vertical arrows, those are cell lines that are missing DNA repair proteins. And so suddenly there's an elevation of how much retrotransposition you're getting when you're lacking repair proteins. And so, again, it was an, it's not talking much about how L1 retrotransposition works normally, but does start to show this interface between repair proteins and how these things jump around. And that was, this assay and this idea was also the basis of, of the work I did. And what I'm going to show here is work from my first paper as well as a follow-up paper uh, with Nick Wallace, other people in the lab where we looked at inhibitors of DNA repair proteins, including caffeine, wartmanin, vanillin. Um, these are things that you might have ingested, <laughs> not the wartmanin, hopefully, but the caffeine and the vanillin. And so what's represented here, these are just colony counts. These are just quantifying the number of colonies you see in the bars compared to untreated. So the very left hand untreated, that's set at 100%. And then the black bars represent how, many, how much L1 retrotransposition is going on. So the diagrams representing that when you add caffeine to the media, retrotransposition goes away. 
So you're inhibiting something that's important for retrotransposition. And this was also true of the warp mannon, that the warp mannon also seemed to decrease retrotransposition. Uh, additionally, the one gene I've, you might have seen a little bit of is ATM. We co-overexpress something that should impact ATM activity, something known as a dominant negative kinase deficient mutant. And what we saw there is that by impacting ATM function, you decrease the amount of retrotransposition. So, um, we also characterize another protein, another repair complex known as ERCC1 XPF. And again, similar here, we had a cell line that's missing the ERCC1 gene. And so we looked at the baseline amount of retrotransposition, that dark gray bar. And when we added ERCC1 back to the cells, we saw a decrease in retrotransposition. So again, this is this argument that this protein limits the ability for retrotransposition to occur. And we did the converse experiment where ERCC1's partner in DNA repair, XPF1, if we decrease the amount of XPF1 in cells, then these big gray bars go up in terms of how much retrotransposition is occurring. So again, the bottom line is that the work I was doing in, in the lab was demonstrating these interactions of how repair proteins play a role or are involved in either promoting or limiting L1 retrotransposition. So any questions about the types of work I was doing to demonstrate the relationship between L1 retrotransposition, making double strand breaks, and how cells reply to that? And I'm a step a little bit closer, and now I have about 20 more, about 10 more people in my chat range. This is a good point to pause, because I'll talk about the impact of these data. Uh, I don't know if I'll say much about caffeine. Caffeine inhibits a lot of things, and sunbathing is not a good thing. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure they're bad together, but <laughs> all right. So let me talk. I'm going to get through the impact of this of this work, and this is something that again, this was published in 2006. Some publications 2008, but I wanted to take again one more little side point here of talking about methylation, and what methylation really represents is a chemical modification to genes that help turn them off. And you can't on cells on purpose can turn them back on, but can you get rid of methylation? And what this review uh, covers is this idea that uh, in young, healthy cells, repeat elements, again, most specifically, are methylated to be quiet. And that a lot of genes that are being expressed are unmethylated, but then there's different status of methylation for different parts of the genome, for different genes. And the... the um, The thing that he's also trying to represent, he's trying to, he, this is again a review talking about a, a wide amount of data that's gone into this, is that people have noticed that as cells get older, methylation repression doesn't work as well. It starts to go away. You can chemically measure this by measuring the methylation. And then if you think about cancer, cancer is the same way in that uh, when people look at cancer cells and say, what's the methylation status of these things, then the methylation is is gone from a lot of repetitive elements. And so, um, well, again, so I think there are some technical points that I wanna make from the diagrams, but I hope that some of the summary um, slides and summary statements I'm making are helping you get uh, the bottom line, the impression of what the, the data means and what it's about. So this is, you know, this is one of the, the key points of what we were working on in the, again, this was, I did my work in Prescott Dinier's lab. One of the key kind of take home lessons from this was, well, this ability to look at these molecularly doesn't mean a whole lot unless there's actually expression of these is actually happening in cells. And so, um, Victoria Balancio, who's in the lab, was doing some very intriguing work of trying to detect these constructs, the expression of L1 elements inside both cancer cells 
as well as non-cancer cells. And what she found was that these can be expressed at a very low level, they can be found, but then also elements of it that are only expressing the damaging parts, the endonuclease and the reverse transcriptase from ORF2 can also be damaging the cells. And so this was something where I think a lot of the field had been very focused on the expression of full length as being important and looking at methylation of full length elements as important. But in fact, the ability of par these parts of it to be expressed could also be damaging and be something related to um, cancer as well as aging. And so I'm going to talk through, again, uh, again a variety of different talks, uh, different papers are published subsequent to this, looking at the relationship between L1 and different biology of either mice or human cells. And the first one here is looking at how line one seems to play an important role, or it's very important to suppress these elements in the cells that make sperm and egg. And so this work from the Timothy Bester lab on the left is showing that when you get rid of a gene that methylates repetitive elements, again, so now we have unmethylated line one elements are showing that it's being expressed, that these green lines you have on the left, this is how normal meiosis looks. But these um, green squiggly lines that are basically all, all messed up and not correct and not going to give you a um, correct sperm is what you see when you allow L1 expression to run rampant. And consequently, those mice are infertile. And then this was work also from other groups showing that, again, these little diagrams on the left hand side we have normal a normal mouse on the right hand side they're missing a gene that allows l1 expression to basically go all over the place in uh, gametes and those development cells and you'll see that, that this cloud of green that you have on the left hand side and these are uh, sperm cells going through meiosis and trying to basically make functional gametes that those populations are missing and once those populations are missing, you can't have sperm, they're not going to develop, and thus you have infertility. And they developed this as a model, saying that these factors that help with methylation, help regulate the RNA, basically, uh, if, you, if, you don't have, if you have weak repression, then you have no progeny, you have infertility, and you need to have strong repression in order to have functional sperm. And again, they connected this to the expression of these L1 elements. And this is a similar study looking at female mice, where they're talking about the development of oocytes. And the overall impression I want to give here is that they looked at a gene that, uh, again, maelstrom, that the red represents maelstrom missing, so a mutant. And so what's happening in the red cells is that you have more expression of L1. And um, what's represented here on the left-hand side are different phenotypes of oocytes. And so this very first diagram is the number of oocytes. And you'll notice the first thing you notice right away is that you have a lot less functional oocytes when you're missing this gene, the red one. And then this is looking at phenotypes of things that have gone wrong. And they're lacking crossovers. The metaphase is not working. The, the chromosomes are messed up that when you are missing the maelstrom gene, boom, you have a lot more defects in cells. And then finally, um, this is just looking at aneuploid embryos that the actual um, you know, fertilized eggs develop with chromosome abnormalities when you don't have this repressive gene. And now this is one of the key things I think is happening that we had suggested and proposed way back when, is that the lack of this gene that causes all these problems in oocytes can be partially alleviated by reverse transcriptase inhibitor, right? Now, reverse transcription doesn't do anything in terms of human biology, right? Does anybody happen to know a, th a therapy that we use reverse transcriptase inhibitors for? Is there a well-known popular? Yeah, HIV, right? So HIV is a retrovirus and you can inhibit its life cycle by adding reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And that's what they're doing in this example too, is they're trying to use reverse transcriptase inhibitors to um, alleviate the symptoms. And that's where you see the light pink. The fact that the light pink bars are showing higher functional oocytes than the dark red means that you're alleviating the phenotype. 
which is arguing that, again, the best example of probably what the cause of this is, is L1 uh, being inhibited so that the damage it's causing or its ability to um, do reverse transcription is what's causing the death of cells in the first place. Now move on to a different topic that talk about the brain. And again, in summary, the um, several labs, primarily Fred Gage, was very interested in how neurons develop and how brain development occurs. And they had this connection that L1 expression can actually get alleviated during developmental cycles. And what can happen here is, and what these diagrams all represent, is bars that represent how much L1 jumping they can detect in these different types of cells. So when they look in the hippocampus, you see this higher black bar indicating that L1 has been jumping around in those neurons as compared to heart or liver or cardiac tissue. And then in this diagram, in a different paper, they... Um, try to decrease the amount of a DNA repair protein. And in fact, in this case, they're also decreasing ATM, the gene that I said earlier seems to play a role in helping promote L1. In this case, they saw an increase in the amount of retrotransposition that was occurring using a modified construct that allowed it to uh, jump around more. So maybe, and their hypothesis was, if these are jumping around more in ATM deficient cells, maybe that explains the phenotype in individuals who are deficient in ATM. And then these are some nice green cells. So there's another assay you can do. So I showed a colony assay where every time a retrotransposition event occurs, a colony is allowed to grow in a plate. Well, this is another way of doing the assay where if the retrotransposition occurs, things get green. So this is a green fluorescent protein. And they were showing that in normal cells, you have low levels of retrotransposition, but in a... Uh, Again, another a gene that's not able to methylate retrotrans, retrotransposons, you get a lot more jumping around inside neurons. And then these bars here, all these dark black bars, the fact that they're bigger is demonstrating that when you've knocked out this gene, that you're getting retrotransposition at a much higher rate than you otherwise would expect in neurons. And so again, the summary idea there is that these retrotransposons may be contributing to uh, neuroplasticity, neuronic variation, but importantly, when we think about all these syndromes that show brain or developmental delays or other phenotypes in those progeroid, syndrome, progeroid syndromes, that may be one of the causative agents of that is L1 being active in them and causing, again, DNA damage or retrotransposition or other things happening in those neurons. Getting back to cancer. That what these bars represent is expression of retrotransposons in different cancer cell lines. So this has been shown by a lot of different groups where they've looked at the amount of expression, the amount of demethylation, other things, but they're actually functionally able to see these proteins as a common feature of a lot of different cancers that are actually coming in through you know, patient samples. And what we have here on the right is, again, another example. Again, there are multiple in the literature where if you're missing the ability to, or if you, sorry, if you overexpress a gene that demethylates retrotransposons, and again, it's a gene that's commonly found in many cancers to be overexpressed, that now ORF2 from L1 is being expressed. Again, when you're overexpressing this uh, derepressor, and that in combination, you're also getting these H2AX foci that are marking double strand breaks. And so again, this is connecting L1 expression in actual uh, a molecular phenotype representing cancer that may say, hey, these things being expressed is causing double strand breaks, this mutagenic is a part of cancer. And from the patient perspective, what this diagram here represents is looking at, again, cancer samples and just asking, what is the prognosis of cancer patients when we try and connect their outcome versus how much methylation of L1 there is in their tissues, right? This is like a basic question, like some sort of marker of survivability. 
And so the green bars represents L1 that's well methylated in those patient samples. And the blue bar, which is survival, so more people are dying in the blue bars when L1 is unmethylated and being expressed in their tissues. Again, similarly, and a connecting story back, this is something that just came out this year from the Jeff Boca lab, is that we can talk again about BRCA1. And so they did a screen and measurement of DNA repair genes involved in L1. And what we're seeing here is when you get rid of BRCA1 from, tish, from, from cell lines, you actually get an increase in retrotransposition. And that's what you see in the second and third um, bars, or uh, uh, columns here of the different tissue plates. And then um, when you also decrease the ability of Fanconi's anemia, you get an increase in retrotransposition. And this is a quantification of this over here on the right, that again, showing that, again, compared to a negative control, which is always you have, have to find some sort of baseline in the experiment, that by getting rid of BRCA1, or getting rid of an associated protein called CTP, CTLP, that you get more retrotransposition. So then again, their argument in their paper was, you know, in the absence of BRCA1 or uh, CTLP, you get more retrotransposition that's occurring. All right, and then the final example of an impact I wanna talk about is L1 and a model of aging. So has anybody heard of like this great compound in red wine that might help you live longer? There's a researcher named David Sinclair who's been studying this. Resveratrol, yes, so Synergy has it. And resveratrol is something that helps activate a class of genes known as sirtuins. So sirtuins, again, actually something discovered originally, I think, in yeast that had to do with aging phenotypes. And so what, they've, what people have found is that if you knock out the gene SIRT6, that mice have this accelerated aging phenotype. And that's been well known. And their argument, and the experiment they did here is really, really interesting, is that they basically took SIRT6 mice who are prematurely aging and basically gave them reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Right, so if we look at this diagram, this is comparing uh, survival over time, just again, overall organismal survival, and that the green bars represent normal, the black bars represent the SIRT6 mice, and the red and blue represent SIRT6 mice that have been fed reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And so it's showing this intermediate phenotype. There's some, again, alleviation of the phenotype when you get rid of reverse transcription in these cells. Uh, this one is showing body weight. So again, red and blue is intermediate. And then this is this cognitive test where Again, the black bar represents a long time to get out of a circle, get out of a maze type of thing, and that adding reverse transcriptase inhibitors to these mice's diets helps them do better. And what we also see here is looking at, um, you know, various tissue phenotypes, how badly damaged are uh, replicative tissues, and that the fact that the reverse transcriptase inhibitors are larger and taller black bars means they're doing better off than the mutant mice. And then finally, connecting this all again together to DNA damage, they're measuring how many H2AX foci, which as we've discussed, represents double-strand breaks, <laughs> where Um, again, you have wild type normal mice that you're comparing them to the SIRT6 mice that have these very large bars. And then when you add reverse transcriptase inhibitors, you see a lower level of double strand breaks in those. And so again, their model is that maybe line one activity is very important for uh, contributing to the aging phenotype of these model mice. And again, maybe something that is important for normal aging as a process. So. Again, thanks for bearing with me on some complicated biology. I wanna make sure I showed the breadth of the biology that's been done in this area, try and connect it to the basic biology that was occurring. And again, as a narrative structure connected to the work that I did, all of which I do recognize, understand involves some technical details. But again, hopefully as you're looking at some summaries as I'm about to do and 
going through this as I talk about it, that the basic idea that's coming across makes sense. And so this is a summary slide I want to say is that, you know, L1, these elements that express themselves are considered, you know, repetitive elements, they're selfish DNA. They may be sources of double strand breaks and rearrangements and cDNA that's happening in cells. And that uh, the basic living circumstance we have with them is we try and have genes that keep them from doing this stuff. But there are times when this repression uh, goes away. And so um, I think I've been trying to make the case, and there have been lots of literature saying, hey, maybe the activity of these, when unrepressed, leads to cancer or aging or, uh, again, some defects in neuronal activity and neuronal development. And that in particular, we think this may be the case because there are times where people are missing these genes in terms of syndromes or mouse models where there are very dramatic effects of these happening. So again, now going back to the narrative structure, I said, yeah, what about Nobel Prizes in this area? And I think if you look at the history of Nobel Prizes in medicine, you know, there have been technical achievements with a huge impact. So the structure of DNA, PCR, uh, embryonic stem cell knockouts, uh, the protein GFP that I showed is this great molecular tool and fire and mellow doing RNA interference. So again, amazing, but they didn't necessarily teach us anything per se conceptually new, but important information. Now, there have been discoveries that weren't necessarily incredibly technical or brilliant, but had a major impact on human health. So penicillin is, I think, the classic example there. But then also the discovery of nitric oxide as a vasodilator, right? To some degree, that was new in terms of thinking about it as a messenger. But then also the idea that, you know, this is now the source of Viagra. Um, and then there are these Nobel Prizes where they're awarded for something that turns science on its head. People have gotten very comfortable with what they thought science was, but the Nobel Prize said, hey, that's actually wrong. So McClintock with transposons is a classic example. Uh, I think my favorite one, and he even wrote a book about it, that Stanley Prusner talking about prions. Again, infectious agents that are only proteins. And then Marshall and Warren talking about Helicobacter pylori causing ulcers, and then fire and mellow. I think that also changed the way we think about how gene expression is done as well. And so when we think about these types of criteria for Nobel Prizes, I think, one, I think, if the biology of L1 elements keeps going on the track it does, then I think the idea of cancer, aging, fertility, neuronal diseases, maybe some others, as a source of DNA damage, or as, as a source of, as a causative agent, then I think that case will be relatively easily made. And I think the question is, how do you award, or what is the story the Nobel Prize wants to say? And I think if you want to take the people who have done the most for this field, you think about Hay Kazazian, who again, uh, trained John Moran, as well as Goodyear, uh, Prescott Dininger, who again, this was the work done in his lab, but also Victoria's work. There are two people I haven't mentioned, Astrid Engel and Mark Batzer, who've done a lot of alu biology. And then, of course, there's Jeff Boca, who I think is probably like the most da Vinci of all molecular biologists that I really know of right now. He's done so many things. And he actually um, just an amazing scientist in many different fields. Uh, and then maybe methylation. So it depends what story people would want to tell. Like, I think if people say that the double strand break story is really an important thing, then recognition for that work would, of course, make sense. Uh, if you really want to focus on the genetics, the fact that these are active, then the people who've been doing work in showing these are active in genetic diseases is really important. Uh, so again, it, it depends. There's lots of biology yet to be done. But I think in terms of understanding where the Nobel Prizes may or may not go, then again, at a minimum, I think this work would have contributed to the idea of how these things cause pathologies and disease. So I've hit an hour. I do want to make one last dedication. So there was a person, a luminary in the field, known as Yerzi Yurka. Uh, he is someone who is very involved in the computational understanding of repetitive elements. And uh, you know, in the re I didn't know he died. I had actually worked with him uh, helping a student do a research project. Um, and he was just super kind and generous with his time and very helpful. So um, again, I didn't work with him very much, but people in the field, uh, I think, really liked him, and he did a lot of really amazing work. So a dedication to Yurza Yurka, who passed away in 2014. And then there's some background reading in this in the slide. So I will end my talk there, and I have time for questions. Happy to stick around for half an hour or whatever to clarify anything, to give some more summaries, whatever would help with um, the talk.
So I emailed the PDF to Chantal this morning. You can look at it. Yeah, I mean, there's this. Let me just also say, I know that there were some complaints in the text, which I think I missed it, the most of it at the beginning. You know, some science is complicated, and I wanted to make sure that there was both the breadth of what the importance of this was to make the case for the Nobel Prize, as well as trying to get into some of the details. So Vic is asking, what kind of medium do you use for the plates? And he only worked with plant DNA. Uh, the way human cells are doing, again, one thing that's actually kind of funny about a lot of human biology that we understand through tissue culture is that we want to use adherent cells, things that actually adhere to plates. And so um, people, you know, plastic makers make these plates that have relatively good substrates for things like HeLa cells or human epithelial cells to attach to. And so those are the types of plates we're using there. Again, I don't remember the brand name. Okay, great. Violet, thanks for enjoying the talk. Nice seeing you again. Oop, wait, I think I saw, I think I'm gonna, that's going pretty fast. Um, okay, there's a question from Radran Rao. Could this research result in medicines repressing the aging process? And I think, yeah, that's the big idea, right? Um, and let me say, let me give the positive and let me give the pessimistic side. So the positive is, if these elements are something that are really responsible for aging, for causing DNA damage, and that's something that's just normally happening, happening in normal individuals, then finding either A, that reverse transcriptase inhibitors are effective, would mean more people should take those all the time, or again, maybe more importantly, find a very exquisite way of stopping the endonuclease activity. There's no drug that specifically targets, that I know of, the, uh, re the endonuclease activity of these elements. Again, that's possible to make. Maybe somebody will at some point. Or maybe there would be a genetic engineering solution to this, that find a way to repress the expression or to use CRISPR to inactivate them. These are all things that would make sense. And so to me, I think the, uh, the argument of the biology is that that's what we're seeing in these models. And then that's also my pessimistic point is that one of the things, um, uh, and I'll get to your point, Sidrogy, in a second, you know, is that when you start from, from a science point of view, you have to do stuff that you can study and understand and interpret experiments from. And so a lot of times working with mutants is a very powerful way to understand stuff, but could also be slightly misleading in terms of what the science really, really means, how you interpret it and what it's useful for. So I think that's kind of, did I answer your question, Radron? That would be the way it, we'll see. I think to me, the case has, has been made is that if you can inhibit this, we should definitely find out what happens. We should do those studies. <laughs> uh, so I have a question here. Well, sorry, so a, a point from um, Scissor G talking about, according to David Sinclair, DNA damage is not central to aging, it's epigenetic change clones are not older than the original organism. And so I think, you know, um, there definitely are different models that David Sinclair talks about in terms of what aging really represents. And I think there's also the hormonal change model. Uh, again, a part of aging could be the depletion of stem cells, which has to do with the fact that all cells that we're born with have a limited lifespan because of telomeres and we don't replenish telomeres. Um, so there's always a cap on aging and that's certainly going to be an effect on aging. But is that necessarily the contributor to a lot of the damage that makes us age faster or makes aging a bad process? 
Um, so I think, you know, there definitely are other models for how aging occurs, how DNA damage occurs, the sources of DNA damage. Um, you know, DNA replication is something that is, that can lead to double strand breaks. And maybe that's the main source. We always need to replicate our DNA. So maybe that's the issue there. Um, okay, so uh, Max a asks an interesting question, repeated by Chantel. Stephen, I came in a little late, but is there a relationship between L1 retrotransposition and the increase in meiotic errors that you see in older females? So this is a part of the complicated biology I didn't want to get into. But my basic answer would be no. That the, um, what's called the um, advanced maternal age, where the segregation of chromosomes doesn't work very well, largely has to do with the fact that female oocytes are arrested before they divide their chromosomes. They're, they're held there for a really long period of time. And that, that stringency of holding them that way just doesn't work as well after the age of say 35. And so that's really, um, that's really the main thing that's happening in that biology. And then in fact, what this, this last paper I talked about, before you get the oocytes you wanna use for fertilization, there's this restriction process where the ovaries are recognizing bad eggs and they get rid of them. And so that's a, a part of where the L1 biology may be playing a role. It's not so much in, um, the reason L1 biology may not play as much a role in female fertility as male fertility is because there is this checkpoint where they say, are these good eggs or bad eggs? And if L1 has made something to be a bad egg, it never becomes an ovum. Is I think the question is the way I would answer that question. So Sue, oh, sorry. Um, let me go back chronologically. I, there's a couple questions about what is the DNA damage maybe we're talking about here. Oh, yeah, so, uh, so actually, i answer with Suma's question. So Suma's question was, when a Nobel Prize is awarded, there's always a one-line phrase that describes what the award is for. What is my one-line phrase? Now, again, I didn't necessarily want to propose one, but let's propose it where they do want to award me for the primary observation that I'm talking about for my work. And there are other ways we can phrase it, but let's bias it towards me. I hope you'll forgive me for that one. But it would be, the, is awarded for the discovery that retro transposons make double strand breaks that contributes to aging, cancer, and disease. That would be the one word phrase. And I think that's, again, that's the key insight that came from, from my work was the first one to attempt to really look at this double strand break activating activity of L1 that as it's trying to integrate itself into the DNA. Remember, the life cycle of L1 is, is trying to jump into DNA. It's trying to get in there. So it's got to break it to get in, like a thief. Which is asking me to repeat the one-line phrase, and it is, the Nobel Prize is awarded for the discovery that double-strand breaks caused by retrotransposons, or retrotransposition, causes, or is a causative agent for aging, cancer, and other diseases. So mushrooms actually ask a really interesting question, which is why does it do this, right? And I think um, this gets into some very deep questions because there's not an answer per se, but very deep questions about what is the replication of DNA? What is evolution? What is biology? That from their perspective, like I kind of wrote it in the title, these are just parasites. These are things that are interested in their own replication. They have the chemistry for their own replication. They jump around. That's what they do. And so they're just parasites that do this. And so that's what it is. I mean, it's just some, it's a phenomic parasite that's trying to get, jump around and get, get in there. And of course we build defenses for it, right? Biology says, hey, this is not good for us. Let's build defenses to try and stop it. And then when those defenses break down, they go wild. No, I think, okay, so, yeah, that's a very deep question. Uh, so Mushroom asks, you know, where does this element come from? And the answer is people don't per se know. They're ancient, right? These types of activities are ancient. The reverse transcription 
I'm sorry, the reverse transcriptase seems to be related to retroviral reverse transcriptases, but maybe they're also related to the reverse transcriptase you find in telomerase. Um, so maybe some sort of mad scientist mother nature point happened where you combined a native reverse transcriptase with an end nuclease. So it just got combined together somehow, and then they became active. So I think, so we're, I think the only thing I'll say about this talk was it was a way for me to not think about COVID-19, uh, Aaron, that this is an opportunity to think and do stuff that's not thinking about the current conditions. And there's no real relationship between the two. Well, so again, so, well, Aaron, you're not asking about COVID-19, you're asking about a solution to aging. Um, okay, so mushroom asks again, this question, which, um, you know, reverse transcriptases. So the central dogma of molecular biology as proposed by James Watson is that DNA is made into RNA, which is a similar related molecule and then the RNA makes proteins. And so that's a stepwise, that's a, a forward path of how we make, make genes, how we make proteins from genes. And the reverse is basically taking RNA and turning it back into DNA. And so that step where you've heard of retroviruses, HIV, that's the reverse of that process. So that's why it's what we call reverse transcriptase. So I think, so there's a question that I think I, again, because of the chat range extender, I've missed some questions. Uh, there was one that was just, what's a brief summary of what L1 is or does? I think I've kind of answered that question, that it's a small parasite. It expresses itself, expresses proteins to move around. Um, again, just to summarize other aspects of the talk, to say that this activity of trying to jump around genomes can impact DNA and cells negatively. And specifically, it looks like it's x-ray damage, like making double strand breaks that's breaking DNA. Radron asks an interesting question. Will this be used to insert genes or for gene therapy? People have um, developed constructs that do that. The problem is that this reverse transcription and the insertion of these elements is variable. You don't always get the full length thing back. In fact, most of the time, this reverse transcription, maybe because of DNA repair proteins, maybe because it's just not very good, you don't get the same size. The, 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 thing, the size of the thing you're starting with, you never get that same size back. And so when it comes to like gene integration, gene delivery vectors, so there's so many other ones that are much better at it than that. So you don't want to use this process for that. Yeah, Tagline mentions, again, a classic Nobel Prize, David Baltimore showing, again, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for this, again, this, this um, lateral thinking type of thing that viruses, particularly um, reverse transcriptase viruses, can be causative agents in cancer. And that was something that people had been kind of not thinking as, as a cancer source. Um, so David Baltimore developed the Baltimore classification of viruses based on their mechanism of replication. Well, so again, the source of the reverse L1, 
you're asking, is it a non-human virus? And I think, you know, that's a reasonable way to connect and think about it, that when we think about HIV or reverse, you know, um, retroviruses, it's similar. It's trying to do something similar, but it's never trying to leave a cell. So a lot of retroviruses, of course, make coat proteins and then try to infect other cells. Whereas these are just genome parasites because they, they never leave the cell on their own. So Len brings up a point that they say Alzheimer's is cancer of the brain. You know, brain pathologies have a lot of different causes and thoughts for where they're coming from. You know, I, some of that has to do with inflammation. Some of that has to do with maybe prions, misfolded proteins. Um, some of that may have to do with just the lack of sleep. You know, there are these things that happen in brain biology that's a little bit different. These may be re related to certain types of pathologies where the DNA damage, the fragility of the genome may be relative, may be important for how brain development occurs. Welcome, David. So Shiloh asked about leukemia. Is this a condition of perpetual DNA damage? And so a lot of the classic leukemias, like um, the Janet Rowley covers this in some ways, and the diagrams in there, that a lot of leukemias, especially the childhood ones, are an example where translocation occurs and makes a novel fusion protein. So maybe you take the ability to express and be a stable protein from, say, gene A, and then gene B, the part of it that tells the cells to grow rapidly without the fact, without the ability to suppress that activity. And so these gene fusions, these chimeric genes and proteins are considered a primary driver of leukemia. Now, there are other leukemias that seem to be related to DNA damage. Uh, I don't know that anybody, I haven't delved into it particularly about how much DNA damage is related to lots of classifications of leukemias. Yeah, no, I think the tagline mentions the right thing, that cancer requires a disruption in control of cell replication. Again, there are four main things considered in neoplasticity, and that is one, unregulated cell cycle, unregulated and driven proliferation, the ability to metastasize, move to other parts of the cell, and then also immune evasion. And so this model we have for how cancer occurs means that lots of things have to be going wrong and that these are changes in, again, in many cases in mutations, but maybe as mentioned before, epigenetics where expression is different. Again, the genes aren't mutated, but the expression patterns are different. You know, it's very complicated. Cancer is like a super complicated thing, um, but mutations that help create these steps the gene dysregulation that leads to a cancer phenotype, mutations are one of the underlying, I would say, features of it. Especially when we consider that when you compare the chromosomes of cancer cells that have all these translocations, disruptions, wrong numbers of chromosome copies, that seems to be an underlying feature of a wide variety of cancers. Yeah. Yeah, so you is right. It depends on how you define whether a cancer is a disease or a multitude of different ones. I think it's important to ca classify them as a multitude of different ones because the way you treat them is very different. So breast cancer, one of the classic ways of treating breast cancer is that there's a, a, a proliferation of cancer cells. You treat them with um, estrogen inhibitors. And then, in fact, if you're like two thirds of breast cancers, if you treat them with estrogen inhibitors, this proliferative signal to grow goes away. And there are examples of older women who go through menopause and then their cancer goes into remission. And that's a kind of one of those interesting aspects of thinking about how the specific tissue you're dealing with is important to treating the cancer. Well, and that's, 
sometimes part of the design widget is that you um, you try and get the main message across to your audience, get them thinking about it even. Maybe they don't understand all of it, but they get thinking about it. You can answer those types of questions, delve into it. Well, okay, so Shiloh asked an interesting question. Uh, what about men who face prostate cancer? They are not undergoing hormonal changes. What kind of cell damage is occurring? Yeah, prostate cancer is not something I'm an expert on. Uh, one of the things that is an indicator of prostate cancer is this, although this is also controversial, is prostate-specific antigen, which I think is something related to prostate cell growth and then release into the bloodstream. You know, um, I don't, other than the general idea that DNA damage is important for maybe being a causative or beginning agent for prostate cancer, that that's a problem. And the fact is, you know, prostate can cancer, oh, I'll come back to your point in a moment, Pegline, that, you know, prostate cancer, again, is not one of these cancers of aging. You get older and maybe you um, have some alleles that give you a predisposition to it. But again, it's an, you know, cancer as an, as an aging related pathology is kind of still out there. Uh, so tagline mentions that, you know, the way to treat prostate cancer is chemical castration. That again, testosterone is something that still drives the growth signal for prostate cells. And so if you get rid of that driving signal, that doesn't mean you've cured the cancer. You just mean you've cured a part of the issue that's driving the cancer to do what it is. No, no, I know. I mean, cancer, I mean, surgery, I think, is usually a main option for prostate cancer. I don't know. No, no, it's not. Again, I, I'm a molecular biologist. I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't necessarily answer <laughs> those types of medical questions. Well, thank you, Ariana. We'll see. Um, you know, the one thing that of course, is important to recognize in Nobel Prizes is that they usually award it to people who have a long history of, of contributing to the field. So I think um, I'm not in that field anymore. I don't do retrotransposition biology anymore. Uh, well, any other questions about L1 biology and DNA damage? Thanks, Aaron. Bye, Mushroom. You're welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I guess this will be a long video, although the talk itself did hit an hour. All right. With that, I'll close it up. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll probably be online for a little bit longer. If you have any questions, just IM me. Otherwise, I will um, see you all next week or next time. <laughs>